Um, so um, I will uh, give you um, uh, an uh, outline of my presentation. I will give you a brief introduction um, and some example of uh, extracellular vesicle heterogeneity. And then I will focus um, the rest of my talk on the large oncosomes. And um, I'll give you my, we, um, my uh, view on the potentials that we have uh, by studying uh, extracellular vesicles for biomarker development. Um, extracellular vesicles are membrane enclosed particles that can vary in size. They can be very, very small uh, to uh, the level of few nanometers, and they can be very large, reaching uh, over 10 micron in diameter. And they can be released by any living organism uh, in the universe um, and can be identified uh, in all body fluids um, um, because they are secreted actively uh, by the cells. Um, the, the, this is a, an interesting review that was um, published in 2009 by Emanuele Cocucci. Um, and it really signed uh, uh, the, the switch of an era because the extracellular vesicles have been studied for several decades, but it's been only uh, in the last five to 10 years that um, people have become more and more aware of the importance of these extracellular vesicles and excluded that uh, there is uh, no, um, um, they are not an artifact. Um, if the uh, extracellular vesicles play a distinct uh, function, um, often highly um, specialized function um, that tend to reflect the function of the originating cell. Uh, these functions include um, the ones that are written here. Um, and uh, as far as cancer is concerned, uh, extracellular vesicles have been demonstrated to play function in transformation, androgenesis, metastasis, um, transfer of drug resistance, um, etc. Um, the, there is a wide range of extracellular vesicle population that uh, differs not only in size but also in function, biogenesis, uh, and mechanism of communication with target cells. Um, and we all know now that different cell types release different population of extracellular vesicles, and each cell can release uh, um, different types uh, of um, TVs. Um, this is a, a, an editorial that was uh, published last year in the Journal of Extracellular Vesicles by the International Society for Extracellular uh, Vesicles of which um, I am an executive board member. And I highly uh, suggest to read this editorial um, because uh, it really deals with the importance to uh, approach the field um, well knowing what are the caveats and what are what is the complexity of the extracellular vesicles. And I think that's um, a, a good way to start, especially for people who are new to the field, um, in a way um, that uh, is not frustrating and it allows um, to understand how to study the complexity of extracellular vesicles at the best. And this figure um, here um, shows that, um, that there has been um, an incredible uh, increase uh, of the publications on extracellular vesicles, which um, have gone uh, by different names, uh, including um, exosome, microvesicles, and others, um, especially since 2005 when the field has, has really uh, been uh, blooming and we understand more and more about these vesicles. These are uh, three um, seminal papers that were published in all in 2007, 2008 by the groups of Sandra Breakfield, Jan Lotwal, and Janusz Rak and they uh, all in nature cell biology. And uh, I just want to point out that these papers have been cited all together more than 5,000 times in only seven to eight years. And they all um, 
brought up the um, focus on the importance of these extracellular vesicles that can be released by tumor cells and other type of cells and transfer RNA and genomic information uh, with, which induce these uh, functional changes uh, in uh, recipient cells. Um, also, these two uh, papers are uh, very uh, important and they are much more recent. Um, they were published from David Leiden Group um, in 2012 and 2015, respectively. Um, and um, they, they really um, they provide very nice uh, in vivo evidence of the role of the exosomes from melanoma cell in the first paper, um, uh, which are able to prepare the pre-metastatic niche um, uh, through activation of uh, MET signaling pathway. And in the second paper, uh, which was published earlier on this year, uh, they even demonstrate that tumor exosomes contain surface molecules, in particular uh, selected classes of integrins that are responsible of the homing to the metastatic side of the, uh, orig of the tumor cell. Uh, from which these vesicles originate, suggesting and confirming an incredibly important functional role uh, to these vesicles. Uh, one of the pioneers uh, in the field uh, and one uh, of the most active scientists uh, in extracellular vesicles has been certainly Clotilde Terry. Um, and I bumped in this review a few days ago, uh, written by her, uh, which has this uh, question in a provocative title, are all exosomes equal? And I just uh, want to use this uh, slide to uh, take advantage of this review to um, point out that it's turning out that uh, even uh, if you isolate specifically exosomes, you can see that uh, different exosomes exhibit different classes of molecules, which is uh, intuitive in a way, because if we imagine that the cells release these uh, vesicles continuously, um, and we, we still don't know exactly what are the mechanisms of selection of cargo uh, to one or another type of vesicles, uh, of course, uh, not all exosomes will carry the same information. And that's why it is important to uh, study them as a, a population uh, that is very um, variegated. These are um, uh, additional two studies from uh, Richard Simpson group um, in Australia. Um, in, uh, in, in the first paper, they identify uh, by mass spectrometry two distinct population of exosomes released by uh, colon cancer cells. Uh, and in the follow-up paper that was published, uh, I think this year in PLOS One, they, um, uh, they realized that these uh, two population of extracellular vesicles can actually uh, be uh, 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 even great, more greatly separated in three, uh, 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 three population of vesicles um, by um, profiling the microRNA uh, of, of these vesicles, suggesting again that uh, when we isolate, it's very important to keep in mind that whatever method we isolate for purification of these vesicles, we will end up with a mixture of vesicles. But, and, and, and this is very important, and I just want to uh, take a moment uh, to mention that um, uh, there are several kits that have been uh, commercialized, and some of them are very useful. To, to have a very uh, quick analysis of these extracellular vesicles. However, it is important to uh, study more deeply uh, the, the difference between this, uh, these extracellular vesicles because each of them might contain um, different um, information. There are, um, uh, this is another study from uh, Rossella Crescitelli uh, in Jan Lotwell group in Gothenburg, um, a study that was performed in collaboration with Edith Buzas uh, in, um, in um, uh, Budapest. Um, and um, it, uh, it, this was published in the Journal of Extracellular Vesicles. Uh, and uh, they, uh, the authors identified um, a distinct profile of, uh, in the RNA um, contained uh, in apoptotic bodies, microvesicles, and uh, exosomes, suggesting again that um, there are a different population um, of extracellular vesicles. 
As far as the size is concerned, there are definitely uh, there is definitely a wide range of uh, EV size. And uh, here on the left, we have an example of exosome. This is a very uh, well-known uh, image from Johan Scott that was published in Nature Cell Biology in 2008, um, depicting this uh, cell completely uh, filled with um, exosomes and um, uh, which can only be uh, visible by electron microscopy. On the right, we have the large oncosomes that I will uh, talk to you more in detail in a second. Uh, this is a 10 micron bar size. So you, as you can see, the large oncosomes also in the, in the lower schematic are uh, very large and they almost reach the, the, the diameter of the cells. Uh, these are other images of the large oncosomes. Um, we know now that these uh, vesicles can arise from non-apoptotic membrane plebs. Uh, we performed several experiments to um, exclude the possibility that the cells were undergoing apoptosis. And as you can see, uh, we can visualize them not only uh, on the plasma membrane of the tumor cells, but they are also shed in the surrounding uh, environment, which made us thinking that we could isolate them um, for, um, uh, to study them. And this is a scheme uh, from a review that was published in 2008 that illustrate how the, the mechanism, the, uh, the basic mechanism of membrane plebbing, which we still don't know um, enough about. However, it seems that the, the, the pleb arise for a passive mechanism uh, when the fibrillary actin cortex uh, is Structured and uh, there is a, because there is an increase uh, of the hydrostatic pressure in the cytoplasm, and this determines the formation of the pleb. And only when the fibrillary actin reforms at the cortex uh, by an active mechanism that involves um, um, activation of ROA and ROC kinase with um, consequent phosphorylation of myosin uh, to uh, light chain, there is a retraction of the vesicles. And it's this continuous formation and retraction of the vesicles that confers the ability to migrate to uh, these very aggressive amoeboid tumor cells. We published a few studies in the last uh, seven years. Uh, this is work uh, that was performed uh, as a collaboration between my group and Michael Freeman group. And we demonstrated that large oncosomes can be released by migratory amoeboid cells, which are really the very aggressive and metastatic tumor cells uh, as a consequence of constitutive activation of AKT or expression of carrier in one, also EGFR activation induces the phenomenon. And importantly, we demonstrated that um, silencing of DIF3, which is a diaphanous related forming, uh, which is involved in actin nucleation and cytoskeleton modulation, also induced the phenomenon uh, in pretty dramatically. And we demonstrated in this uh, cancer research paper in collaboration with Ramin Berukin at the Broad Institute that um, the, the locus on which DIF3 um, is um, codified on chromosome 13 uh, is frequently um, deleted uh, in metastatic um, prostate cancer, but not uh, in, um, uh, in local disease, suggesting that this is an important phenomenon uh, in uh, advanced um, prostate cancer. And I just want to mention, because I'm not going to show you um, many data on different type of tumors that we now know that large oncosomes are produced by any type of tumor, not only by uh, prostate cancer. We went on and uh, attempted to identify these large oncosomes um, in circulation and in tissues taking advantage of their large um, size. Um, we first used the um, mouse model of prostate cancer uh, in which um, we uh, demonstrated that carrying one positive large vesicles in the size range between 1 and 10 micron and the events were counted and quantified by flow cytometry using specific size bits. Um, we demonstrated that there was a correlation between the number of these vesicles uh, and um, um, the presence of metastasis in the mouse. And we also attempted to perform a similar experiment 
um, in uh, human plasma, and we demonstrated that these Kavirin one positive events uh, were significantly um, uh, increased in patients with castration resistance metastatic disease in comparison with uh, um, patients with uh, uh, indolent prostate cancer, which is very important um, prognostically. And um, I want to also mention that the experiment on the um, human plasma was performed using filtration, a method that Matteo Morello in the lab um, um, set up um, a few years ago. And uh, with this methodology, um, we uh, could perform this experiment by using uh, only 200 microliters of plasma. Then we went to the tissues and we used uh, cytokeratin 18, uh, which nicely stained the plasma membrane um, of the um, of the tumor cells uh, here, and um, we, uh, we we could see uh, using two different tissue microarray uh, in collaboration with Mark Rubin at Cornell Medical Center that the the, the feature this uh, this feature uh, which is the presence of large vesicles in uh, tissue sections again correlates with increased lesion score and metastasis and it's absolutely ab uh, absent uh, in uh, benign uh, tissue. Uh, we also have some evidence uh, by electron microscopy that we can visualize these um, vesicles in, in tissue uh, sections of the tumors. Uh, and as you can see uh, here at higher magnification, uh, we can also see the structure of these vesicles by electron microscopy, and they seem to contain um, uh, polyribosomes, if not other organelles. Um, I'll show you now um, the study that was recently published uh, this, earlier on this year, um, uh, on which we performed a proteomic uh, analysis um, uh, using a SILAC quantitative approach of large oncosomes versus exosomes derived from the same um, uh, cancer cell. And we used as a model a prostate cancer cell in which DIF3 was knocked down, knowing that that uh, has highly, um, uh, a high rate of oncosome shedding. And uh, this was an experiment to confirm that in the DIF3 um, knockdown cells, um, uh, we have an increased number of vesicles larger than one micron and even more uh, vesicles larger than two micron, uh, confirming our uh, previous results. So uh, we, um, we, we, we used uh, the SILAC approach and um, what we found uh, was that the bulk of the proteins um, identified in large oncosome and exosomes was actually the same, and 75% uh, of the proteins exhibit similar levels. However, um, uh, more than 25-30% of the proteins uh, were either uniquely identified in either type of vesicles or they were significantly uh, upregulated uh, in one uh, in the exosome or in the large vesicles. And um, as a confirmation of, um, uh, of what is known in exosomes, we found uh, CD81, CD9, um, and um, other proteins that are commonly identified uh, in exosomes, whereas the proteins that were um, mostly identified in exosomes were um, enzymes uh, that have been um, uh, involved in different important uh, metabolic processes in cancer. When we performed a functional analysis using the FUNGICH tool in collaboration with the, provided by Suresh Mativanan at the um, um, Latrobe University in Melbourne, uh, we noticed that the pathways that were significantly upregulated in the proteins enriched in the large vesicles were a metabolism of carbohydrate and um, gluconeogenesis and um, glutamine metabolism, whereas the pathways that were um, uh, enriched in the vesicle, in the small vessel, in the proteins enriched in small vesicles, um, had more to do with integrins um, and um, uh, tum uh, tumor cell proliferation, as it is uh, known uh, for exosomes. We validated by Western blot uh, the, the enrichment of some of these proteins in our large population of vesicles. In this case, we looked at GOT1. 
um, CD, uh, uh, CD3 was used as an exosome marker, uh, and we um, also um, uh, demonstrated that GOT1 can actually be transferred to recipient cells exposed to the vesicles, um, and uh, this is not uh, an effect um, due to increased uh, RNA um, synthesis, um, uh, as uh, it is shown here by uh, the levels of RNA uh, remaining constant um, after treatment. Um, we also performed a functional experiment because we had seen this enrichment of um, enzymes, uh, particularly um, important in glutamine metabolism. Um, we uh, exposed recipient tumor cells to the large oncosomes and to the exosomes and performed an as activity assay or GOT1 activity assay. And we noticed that the large oncosomes were able to um, induce a robust activation of this assay, uh, and this was not elicited by um, exosomes. We then um, performed several experiments in collaboration with um, Yong Song Go um, uh, at Post Tech University uh, in um, uh, South Korea um, to try to understand what were the, the physical characteristics of these vesicles. And we used uh, eudixanol centrifugation gradients um, and flotation of the the pellets that we obtain by um, ultra centrifugation um, that are commonly used to centrifugate very small particles and larger particles. Um, so everybody, I, I, I guess, is familiar with the fact that when we usually uh, pellet down the particles, uh, we perform a first uh, low speed um, ultra centrifugation to, um, um, to get rid of, um, of uh, cell fragments and entire intact cells. Uh, and then we use a 10,000 G ultra centrifugation to pellet down larger vesicles. And then the supernatant go through another um, round of ultra centrifugation at 100,000 G. We off usually also use filters of 200 nanometers so that in the pellet, we only have the small uh, exosomes uh, below uh, 200 uh, nanometers. But what we did in this experiment, we took the pellets, the 100,000 um, G and the 10,000 G pellet, and we uh, floated them uh, on these uh, gradients. And uh, um, uh, in the uh, exosome pellet, we were able to uh, see vesicles that sedimented at 110 and 115 um, gram per uh, ml, which is the density of the exosomes uh, in, a, in a neodixanol gradient, and they expressed the TSG101 and CD81, which are markers uh, of exosomes, commonly uh, identified in exosomes, and um, the electron microscopy um, confirmed the nature of these vesicles. When we floated the 10,000 G um, vesicles in state, we noticed that the density of the particles was actually very similar to the density of the exosomes and um, with, with, uh, with particles identifiable at 1 to 10, 115 gram per ml. But the, the expression markers were completely different and we, um, uh, we focused on some proteins that we had identified by mass spectrometry uh, and we used um, uh, immunofluorescence to identify these particles by uh, immunofluorescence. Um, as one of the proteins that we identified and that could be a useful biomarker, we have cytokeratin 18 which was in the top five percentile of the proteins identified in large vesicles. And we went on uh, and um, uh, attempted to perform Western blot with an antibody against cytokeratin 18 in uh, vesicles extracted from the plasma of patients with prostate cancer and controls. For this experiment, we used uh, um, ExoQuick, which is um, a very um, commonly used kit to uh, pellet down uh, extracellular vesicles and any other material attached to them. So the kit is not specific for any type of uh, extracellular vesicles, but if you, have, if you want to have um, a, a rough idea of what you're, what you're getting is good. And in our case, we had already uh, demonstrated that cytokeratin 18 was specific for large oncosomes. So in this experiment, we demonstrate that um, cytokeratin 18 is significantly upregulated in 
the plasma of patients uh, with prostate cancer. We did this experiment in collaboration with uh, um, Emma um, Tomlinson Gans and Martin Gleave at the um, uh, Vancouver Prostate Cancer Center. We also used um, an animal uh, model. Um, uh, we, we had uh, previously performed um, a lung metastasis assay uh, in mice um, uh, subjected to um, injections of uh, prostate cancer cells with and without dioxin knockdown. And when we use cytokeratin 18 um, to, um, as, a, as immunity um, affinity purification marker for large vesicles, we notice an increase of these vesicles um, in the plasma of mice uh, with dioxin silenced um, cells metastasis. And these are uh, some sections of the lung metastasis, uh, high magnification showing um, uh, indicated by the red arrows uh, a lot of these uh, features that resemble large oncosomes. Um, this is a conclusive slide from this study uh, that illustrates that um, uh, if we um, um, if we uh, focus on the proteins that were enriched at least four times in the large oncosomes in comparison with exosomes, uh, these proteins, some of them are enriched 20 times or uh, even 40 times and more, um, they are all um, uh, involved uh, in um, prostate cancer progression, metastasis, resistance to radiotherapy, resistance to docetaxel chemotherapy. So again, these data all point out to the uh, possibility that the content uh, and the function of this large oncosome is very important uh, in um, tumor progression um, and metastasis. These data were analyzed uh, all together uh, by Sang Yang Yu, um, uh, computational biologist uh, from South Korea, um, who joined our group a few years ago. Uh, so what, uh, after our studies on large oncosomes, um, our work has been um, confirmed uh, by um, several papers, and I'm seeing more and more frequently uh, descriptions of large vesicles and this is a, um, a very interesting paper that was published last year in Oncogene, um, in which they show um, large vesicles uh, in the diameter of um, uh, the large oncosomes that um, can be uh, released uh, by uh, amoeboid uh, tumor cells uh, during uh, motility. Um, and the paper point out to the fact that the characteristic of this amoeboid migration is the continuous formation and reproduction of membrane plaques. We still don't know how the membrane plaques that form and retract at some point are uh, shed uh, from uh, the vesicles, and there is still a lot of work that is necessary uh, in this uh, field. Uh, there are several studies, including this very recent studies published by the group of uh, Chris Linde Susa Shore, um, uh, who is describing um, tumor derived microvesicles from highly invasive and amoeboid blood mean cells. Um, and um, there are some very nice mechanistic insights uh, in these studies that, again, point out to the importance of these vesicles and to the need to um, understand um, their biogenesis and their cargo better. And finally, uh, on, along the same lines, um, and this is a paper that was published at the end of last year, um, uh, and where um, there is a description of the migrasome, um, a new uh, extracellular organelle uh, that uh, is formed um, uh, in uh, in cells uh, during their migration. So we still don't know how similar all these large vesicles are with each other, um, and uh, we need to do experiments to understand that. However, it is uh, significant that there are more and more of these large vesicles uh, identified. Um, for some reason, they, uh, it, it has been more difficult to identify the larger vesicles than the small vesicles. However, these large vesicles are clearly visible um, in, by, by simple microscopy. Uh, we recently uh, wrote a review that should come up uh, now soon that really um, highlights um, uh, all the names uh, that have been used for large vesicles. Um, and again, uh, it would be interesting to study them better because there are a few informations about cargo at the moment and pathways that elicit the 
recognition of these principles, but there is still a lot to be um, understood. And this is a figure from the same review that illustrates again how uh, tumor cells uh, can um, produce um, different types of extracellular vesicles from the very large, uh, large oncosomes to exosomes, microvesicles and exosomes. Um, and these vesicles can all affect um, the recipient cells in the tumor microenvironment in different ways. Um, and uh, one other thing that contributes to the complexity and to the diversity of extracellular vesicles is that the cells in the tumor microenvironment can then react to the messages delivered by the tumor cells and release other extracellular vesicles um, that um, it can transfer important information. I'll show you now some unpublished data from um, our lab. This is work from Valentina Minciacchi, um, a graduate student uh, in the lab. Um, uh, she um, demonstrates that she can identify uh, extracellular vesicles in recipient cells that can pick them up very easily by uh, microscopy. Uh, the, the vesicles are stained with a lipid dye, which is fluorescently labeled. And um, we can see the diameter of these vesicles is very uh, large, up to two micron. Uh, and I would be careful uh, when uh, images of this kind are shown for exosomes, because it, there is a possibility that uh, the, the the population of exosomes that have been collected contain also larger vesicles, otherwise they wouldn't be visible by common uh, confocal microscopy uh, or immunofluorescent microscopy, uh, given the low resolution of uh, the majority of the instruments. We can follow uh, vesicle uptake by flow cytometry, um, and uh, the uptake of the vesicles um, is um, uh, correlated with the number of vesicles that we use, uh, indicating that this is a specific phenomenon. We have other data to show that this is a specific phenomenon, but uh, in the interest of the time, I'm not going to go uh, through all of them specifically. We used uh, um, um, a system of prostate cancer cell overexpressing myristivated AKT, um, and we noticed that when we isolate large oncosome and exosomes from these uh, tumor cells, uh, phospho, the active form of AKT, which is phosphorylated, uh, it's actually mainly localized um, in the large oncosomes with very uh, low signal in the exosomes. These are our uh, large oncosome marker and uh, exosome markers. Uh, and we use um, another cell, uh, two different cell lines, PC3 uh, and 22RB1, uh, to demonstrate that, uh, uh, to, to test whether phospho-APT was also present um, in cells that don't overexpress the constitutive active form of the protein. And this is the case, um, and the protein uh, is, up, is expressed in large oncosomes. Uh, we then performed um, a kinase assay, which I think is the first time um, uh, a kinase assay is performed directly in extracellular vesicles that were isolated from the cell media and cultured um, in uh, serum-free media. And uh, we show that um, large, the, the, the large oncosomes contain um, phospho-AKT, and the kinase was um, um, very um, uh, stable, and we could identify it also after 24 hours of culture of these vesicles, um, suggesting again that this vesicle can harbor active proteins that can elicit their functional effects for a long time. 24 hours uh, in the body uh, could be uh, a long time. Um, we um, we, uh, th this is uh, uh, clinically relevant, and I apologize if this uh, Western blot uh, did not um, come uh, out uh, for some reason. There is a problem with conversion. But um, fortunately, we have uh, all this Western blot from different uh, patient plasma in which we show that phospho AKT circulates in the large oncosomes and is not detectable in the um, exosomes. 
And I think this is very important if we think about using these extracellular vesicles as biomarkers and we get rid of the larger vesicles, then uh, the signal that we might identify in exosomes might be um, very small. Um, on a functional point of view, um, Valentina tested the role of large oncosomes in uh, tube formation, um, which is um, something that has been used um, to test the function of exosomes. And we confirm that exosomes can induce um, a robust activation of tube formation in endothelial cells. But we notice that large oncosome uh, can induce a much stronger signal. And what was even more striking was that when we um, uh, treated the UVEC cells, uh, not directly with exosome or oncosomes, but with the condition medium of prostate fibroblast exposed to exosomes or large oncosomes, only the condition medium from the uh, fibroblast exposed to large oncosomes uh, could induce um, a significant uh, um, tube formation, suggesting that these large vesicles might have different functions than exosomes and might be um, important um, messengers, not only in the cell-to-cell -cell communication, but also in transferring information uh, from one cell uh, to another for a real complex cross-talk as um, what happens um, in cancer. Uh, we now know uh, that, um, again, there are uh, different types of vesicles. There are microvesicles, there are exosomes, and these large oncosomes. Uh, while we still don't know much about the mechanism of communication used by the large oncosomes with the tumor microenvironment, but we are currently studying them. And I'm not going to show you this data, but we now have also um, um, uh, understood the mechanism of uptake of large oncosomes from uh, tumor cells in the microenvironment, and we can modulate this by using specific inhibitors, um, which is going to be very important also therapeutically. But um, we, um, there is a lot uh, known uh, about the role of exosomes and microvesicles in the tumor microenvironment. Uh, a lot of work, um, uh, especially from uh, Alec Clayton uh, and uh, Jason Weber on the function of PGF beta. Um, and one important uh, discovery has been that uh, from this group has been the TGF, uh, uh, TGF uh, beta um, it exists in both a soluble form and a vesicle bound form, and it seems to play a different function depending on whether it's secreted as a soluble uh, molecule or not. Um, moving on, um, I also want to show uh, this paper. Um, um, it's a very uh, interesting paper that was published by Stefano Pluchino Group um, uh, at the end of last year. Even if it's not cancer and it's focused on a neural stem cell model, it shows, and I really apologize for the uh, image uh, on the left bottom that um, overlaps with something else. This is, again, uh, uh, a technical issue. Uh, but if you can see the, the nanosite plot, uh, basically uh, in this paper they realize that there are two different um, vesicles um, which are uh, smaller and larger and they, um, they see that the activation of uh, um, signaling a downstream pathway in recipient cell is stronger, um, uh, elicited by exosomes, by EVs, is stronger than the signaling pathway elicited by exosomes. And I think this is important. Again, exosomes might have some um, very keen and very specialized functions. However, we, one concept to keep in mind is that larger vesicles can incorporate um, a larger number of molecules, and this could have an uh, important uh, functional um, impact. So in the last part of the talk, I'm going to um, touch the, uh, on the possibilities that we have uh, by studying extracellular vesicles to, um, to develop uh, biomarkers. And I'm using um, this scheme from a very nice review from uh, Janusz Rack um, in uh, Montreal um, in Canada at McGill University. And, um, 
basically what we can do, and this is uh, true for brain tumors, but it's true also for other type of tumors, we can uh, extract the plasma uh, from um, the body. Uh, and there are several groups that are uh, working on the standardization of these procedures and um, creating SOP that can be distributed to all investigators. And this is a very important process. And then we can isolate different type of vesicles, including oncosomes, and, um, and perform a downstream assays, because we now know that these vesicles contain not only proteins, but also uh, nucleic acids. And we can uh, use um, uh, new proteomic tools uh, and um, next generation sequencing to um, uh, characterize uh, the vesicles. Um, one uh, challenge uh, in, uh, has been for a long time in proteomic in mass spectrometry, the fact that there is um, a, a large dynamic range in terms of uh, protein uh, expression in the, in the uh, plasma and um, some of the um, most abundant proteins are um, albumin and um, uh, I mean they're plasma proteins uh, that uh, don't have to do anything with the with the markers the tumor markers that we are trying to identify which is usually in this um, in this range um, so um, uh, I, I think it's very important to consider that the mass spectrometry is, uh, is significantly progressing and there are more and more sensitive methods that we can use today. Uh, and um, uh, isolating a population of vesicles that are specifically released from the tumors is going to be helpful in the future to discover um, uh, biomarkers. And I want to thank uh, Wei Yang, uh, my um, colleague um, at uh, Cedar sinai uh, with whom I've been working for several years uh, and uh, who has been um, terrific um, in uh, helping me um, understanding how we can study uh, the protein content of extracellular vesicles. Uh, but the future uh, is really moving, uh, I mean we're moving also very fast as a field and there are several studies um, especially from um, Hako Lee um, and uh, Ralph Weisler, uh, who are uh, leader, um, leaders uh, in, the, in the field, uh, who are develop uh, different types of microfluidic platforms that allow the separation of um, uh, specific types of extracellular vesicles within seconds and from very small volumes of plasma, like uh, few microliters of plasma. Uh, and this is a snapshot of a study uh, that uh, we, um, uh, we're performing in collaboration with um, Leonora Balai and others at MGH. Um, and um, I'll just go very quickly through uh, what I want to show um, that and basically we use a Hakoli microfluidic um, device uh, to, and where we, and we show that um, uh, EGFR V3, which is a, which is a, a, a mutant um, EGFR, which has clinical uh, significance in glioblastoma, um, is um, identifiable both in large oncosomes and in exosomes. And this is the exosome marker, and this is uh, which is not uh, highly expressed in large oncosomes. Uh, Leonora was able to show um, similar results by real-time PCR in the plasma of mice uh, with the um, uh, U87 EGFR V3 xenografts. And uh, again, with Hakoli, we demonstrated that the plasma of these mice um, contain um, large amounts of EGFR V3 in the large vesicles, as well as in the small vesicles. So one other message is that we cannot just separate them and study them um, uh, as if they were completely different distinct entities. Uh, there are population of vesicles that carry the same type of information, especially when they are uh, derived from the tumor. In the last few minutes, I want to um, uh, show another couple of snapshots of current work. Um, and I'm just giving you the punchline. Uh, I'll, I'll, uh, the papers are in preparation. Um, but it, it, it all has to do with the 
uh, with the um, effort on liquid biopsy, um, uh, it's becoming more and more um, important to um, study uh, plasma DNA, for example, um, uh, in the circulation. Um, and this is very important because biopsies are uh, invasive and they are not always possible. Um, so several groups uh, have been uh, working on uh, this effort. The uh, extracellular vesicles contain DNA. These are um, two papers published by uh, Janus Rack and uh, by uh, Leonora Balai. Um, which reported that they were among the first um, uh, studies reporting the presence of DNA in extracellular vesicles. And these are two more recent studies, one from Rago Calluri group and one from David Leiden uh, and Hector Peinado uh, again, um, which show that uh, exosomes can actually contain um, uh, genomic DNA that span uh, all chromosomes and um, specific mutations originating from the tumors. What we're doing, uh, we are um, using a, a comparative approach again. And um, when we um, look at the um, total amount of single strand and, and double strand DNA um, in the plasma um, um, of mice with tumors, we can see that the majority of the DNA is actually uh, enclosed in large oncosomes with a, a small uh, portion of DNA uh, in the exosomes. We now um, uh, have an additional tool that can be very useful and we need to understand how to use it more uh, efficiently, uh, which is the tunable resistive sensitive pulsing, which allows us to not only visualize and quantify uh, and measure um, particles in the diameter of nanometer, but also particles in the diameter of micrometer, which we know uh, include the large oncosomes. Um, we um, performed a next generation sequence, all genome analysis, and we show that the profile of the uh, PC3 cancer cell is very similar to the profile of the um, uh, large oncosomes derived from these cells. Uh, we can also identify translocation by uh, using this method. And by droplet PCR, um, we can demonstrate uh, and validate the uh, next generation sequencing data and identify uh, specific somatic copy number aberrations um, in, the, um, in the oncosomes that are present in the originating cancer cell. The last snapshot is on uh, RNA. Uh, we have a manuscript in, in um, preparation uh, in which um, we show that the content um, uh, in RNA of large oncosome is again more abundant than uh, in exosomes. Um, we confirm the um, large oncosome um, and exosome entity by using um, markers. And when we look at the, uh, we, we, we perform um, uh, all RNA um, uh, sequencing, uh, mRNA uh, including, and what we see is that the read pairs that can be identified in large oncosomes are um, uh, five times more than what we can identify in exosomes, and the libraries are also of a better quality. These are agilent uh, profile, uh, uh, bioanalyzer profile data showing the profile of the DNA uh, in the which is very different in the two types of vesicles and in the uh, originating cells. Uh, again, the take-home message is, not, is to not exclude larger particles from uh, in the preparations um, uh, because the larger particles released by cancer cells uh, can be um, very uh, important. Um, the last concept I want to uh, give, uh, and just to mention that there are also microRNA in these microvesicles, as we uh, all know very well. So we can uh, we discover a, a microRNA uh, that um, uh, is significantly upregulated uh, in large oncos or in, in vesicles from tumor cells and not from benign cells. And we have the ability, obviously, to overexpress it uh, in cells. Uh, and when we overexpress it in cells, and we then look at the large oncosome and exosome distribution, we can see uh, that the, 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 the microRNA is uh, abundantly um, uh, transferred into these vesicles um, where it can play, um, then we can study the specific functions and we are 
um, in this project we are studying the functions of the microRNA contained in the extracellular vesicles in the uh, immune response um, to the tumor. Uh, and um, um, I think uh, it is important to consider that there are some large vesicles. This is a an interesting paper that was uh, published last year by Munesh Tewari group, the ETNAS. Um, and it was the first quantitative and stoichiometric analysis of the microRNA content of exosomes. Um, and one of the uh, results of these papers is that there, there is not enough room, enough space in each single exosome to contain several copies of a given microRNA. But what I uh, think, uh, uh, I think this is a very important uh, result that we have to absolutely consider. When we study a uh, population of extracellular vesicles, we study them um, in as a complex um, um, range of vesicles, not as single molecules yet. And um, there are definitely larger vesicles that could accommodate um, uh, more abundant uh, material. Um, I take the opportunity to invite everybody to um, our uh, annual um, International Society of Extracellular Vesicle uh, meeting, uh, which will be in uh, Rotterdam in the Netherlands this year, uh, in uh, uh, next year in May. Um, and this is really an ideal venue where there will be about 1,000 delegates. Uh, they are all uh, eager to learn more on extracellular vesicles or they are the real experts in the field. I hope um, to, uh, I, I really recommend um, this and I want to acknowledge um, all uh, present and past collaborators um, on this project and uh, in particular uh, people in my lab um, and um, yeah, um, all collaborators uh, uh, at Cedar sinai or uh, in different places. And thank you for your attention. I'm gonna switch to Randy for questions. So, um, so it seems that there is a question uh, from Simona. How, uh, how do I demonstrate that GOT1 found in recipient cells in trans is transferred by a law and not induced by any other mechanism activated upon a law treatment? Um, I, I don't think we can exclude that. Um, we, the only uh, experiment that we did was to um, exclude that there was um, uh, a, a, a synthesis of GOTs, the one starting from RNA, and that is not the case. So we do believe that the protein is transferred. There are several other evidences in the literature that proteins can be transferred to recipient cells. And the other question is, have you demonstrated by density gradient in plasma samples that cytokeratin A2 is exclusive to a low and not other vesicles? No, this is a very interesting question. Since we have done um, all the um, backup experiments in vitro, we did not do this uh, in vivo. I do believe it is an important experiment to perform. Um, there are things in the plasma that we have to be very uh, aware of, uh, including apoptotic bodies and platelet-derived extracellular vesicles that could be in a similar size range uh, to the large oncosomes. And we are starting a project in collaboration with Edith Buzas, who is an expert of apoptotic bodies at the uh, University of Budapest, to really try to uh, distinguish between the two types of vesicles also in the plasma. There is another um, uh, question from uh, Iro Yuki um, asking, um, all serum plasma cell-free DNA derived from these extracellular vesicles? So this is also very interesting. Uh, question. We are working on this uh, topic uh, with Francesca De Michelis at the University of uh, Trento and Gert Attard in London. Uh, what seems to be the case so far when we um, separate um, large oncosome, exosomes, and then we take the supernatant from the plasma after depleting it from uh, extracellular vesicles, there is a very small component of DNA uh, in the uh, extracellular vesicle free, um, 
fraction. And we do believe that it is important to also uh, try to um, understand what if there is a different diversity in the content of the um, DNA, uh, which is uh, freely floating in the plasma versus the one that is enclosed in the vesicles. And I believe that it's also important to differentiate between the large oncosomes, which are certainly derived from the tumor, and the exosomes, which can be derived by any type of cell in the body when we do uh, this downstream analysis, which could allow us to have a better understanding of how to improve our approach to the lipid biopsy. There is another question from uh, Mutiha asking, um, how could you differ apoptotic and non-apoptotic bleeding? Um, I already uh, touched on that as far as the plasma is concerned. Uh, I can also say that we have performed several experiments in vitro uh, and um, there are, um, it, it's definitely something we have to keep in mind. Apoptotic bodies can reach uh, sizes similar uh, to the ones of extracellular vesicles. In all of our in vitro studies, it seems very clear that this bleeding was um, uh, a mechanism, as other people have demonstrated, that is used by tumor cells to migrate and not to undergo apoptosis. There are more questions. I'm not sure how we're doing with the time. Um, uh, are large oncosome associated to uh, ER alterations? This is a question from Carlos. Um, I have to say that we don't know that. We have not looked into that. Um, um, it's interesting um, to consider, and it's definitely possible at the moment that any type of alteration in any uh, also intracytosolic membrane could lead to alteration uh, of the uh, formation of these vesicles, even if the vesicles seem to be released by the plasma membrane, but we do know that they internalize content from the cytoplasm, and we don't know if there is anything uh, in the uh, here, um, uh, in the misfolding proteins, or uh, even in uh, uh, nuclear uh, lamina structure alterations that um, uh, bring uh, that, that elicit this phenomenon. There is another question from Rose um, asking Do you think these extracellular vesicles could also send death signals to other cells? in response to chemotherapeutic agents. Very interesting, I didn't really think about this. Um, what we know, and we have also uh, preliminary data in the lab, but there is uh, emerging literature uh, from several groups uh, now. Uh, what we know is that um, there is a, uh, the, the extracellular vesicles have the ability to transfer um, resistance uh, to um, uh, chemotherapeutic reagents. Um, whether they can also transfer, uh, I, I think it's very possible that the cells that uh, can capture and are more sensitive to the chemotherapeutic uh, agents can also um, elaborate uh, these and, and, and spit it out uh, in the form of other extracellular vesicles. Um, I think this is going to be the last question uh, from Don. Um, which isolation method do you use to show the differential expression of phospho-AKT um, in patient-derived LO versus exosome? So uh, I forgot to mention, thank you for reminding me uh, this, we have used um, our uh, differential centrifugation protocol follow by OptiPrep flotation. So this is uh, different from papers that um, might have been published without um, um, a very accurate separation between exosome and large oncosomes. So uh, we, um, and, and I want to point out that when, um, since we have applied these, um, these uh, OptiPrep gradient and flotation, um, we have seen much more robust results um, because it is important um, and, and, and currently these are still um, the, the most standardized
standardized method to separate the vesicles um, and uh, in a way that they um, they get cleaved, they get clean from any attached material so we can really study their function specifically. So uh, I think we are finished with the question. Thank you everyone for your attention. I'm gonna switch to Randy to wrap this up.